Today's scripture comes from the book of Romans, chapter 11, verses 18 through 25. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they are, they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they, be, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal, mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God they God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts and to sexual impurity, the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served and created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Amen. May the word that is blessing to the reading and hearing of His holy word. So I had to bring you up to speed before I start. Last week during the uh, children's sermon, I talked to everybody about a battle that had begun ensuing once again this year, and it is a battle over my bird feeder. Um, and this year we have two red squirrels who uh, seem to have a uh, battle in hand. Um, and these, uh, these red squirrels, they, they, I would put feed out for them, but it wasn't enough, so they kept chewing their way into the bag to eat everything that had come out of the bottom of the bag. So I thought, oh, no, I can't put up with this, you know, I, I'm trying to be nice to these guys, but I, I'm not going to have this. So then I put it in a bin, and they couldn't get inside the bin, so then they hired a bear, and the bear ripped the top off the lid, knocked it over just so that the squirrels would eat. The bear didn't eat all, all the food that was laying there, but the next morning when I came out, those squirrels were standing on top of that feed. So I decided, okay, so now my enemy is now not just two red squirrels, but I'm fighting against a bear, too. Um, so I thought, I'll put up my game camera just to see. I need to see what I'm actually up against. And uh, it, it was one evening, and it was one of those dark evenings um, that you couldn't see a lot, but I couldn't make out near the field, near the feeder. It looked like a dark shape. So I went to get a flashlight. Of course, we didn't have any flashlights. I had my big green laser. I shined my laser out there and scanned, and I, I scanned over and saw this big, big bear, biggest bear I've ever seen in my life, laying at the bottom of my bird feeder, just uh, chowing away. And I say, thank God that when I shine that light over, I have to be standing in the bathroom, if you know what I mean. This thing was huge. So I went running through the house. Um, Terry was in the living room, and I was like, big bear, big bear. And I ran upstairs to, to, uh, to mom's bedroom, um, and we charged. We just busted right in her bedroom, because you can look out the window, right down onto the bird feeder. And mom's like, what's wrong? What's wrong? <laughs> and I was like, big bear, big bear. And he showed me the light out the window, saw this, this big bear. I ran by out of the Caleb's room. I shook him awake. He's like, what? What? I said, big bear, big bear. And we ran back to the bedroom. The four of us are now gathered on his bed, shining this laser out the window. And, and what we saw um, later from looking at the, the game footage and just uh, trying, to, trying to get a sizing on him, it was a seven feet tall, seven feet tall, pushing, if not over, 400 pound bear just staring back <laughs> up at us. And when I looked at that, I mean, you just couldn't help feel that, that he was gorgeous, that, that he was amazing. And it was terrifying, but it was a true blessing at the same time to, to see something of this magnitude, a mere 15 feet away. And it made me praise God for such a beautiful creature. But I thought for a moment as I'm standing there praising God, looking at this massive bear, that many people in my shoes wouldn't have been praising God for this creature. And I understand that. Many wouldn't have been praising God because they wouldn't be pleased at the sight of a 400-pound bear laying 15 feet behind their house, eating their, uh, eating their feet. But at the same time, others wouldn't have been praising him because they wouldn't declare this bear to be one of his creations. But instead, a product of evolution created by accident over the course of millions and millions of years. And that makes me sad because when I look out on this beautiful planet, when I look out my window and I see what we have around us, I don't see an accident. I see a, a beautiful, amazing creation so deeply intertwined and interconnected that I can't see 
anything but God. That's what I see. I look outside and I see God, and I just have to, I have to talk to you about that today. So uh, so bear with me, and uh, and we're gonna get through this together. Not that it's punishment, but I, I feel like this needs to be more of a teaching than a preaching. So I'm gonna take the school year for a second. Okay, let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for today, for this moment, for this time, God. I know I just said the word school, God, but please help people to stay awake anyway, God. Allow us to listen to what your spirit teaches us and help us to apply it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love the phone up here just in case, too, because, I don't know, if you fall asleep in the middle, I may need some laughter. I feel like it's only going to come from this device. So I have it as a backup, just in case. Um, but I have to start by taking a look at the world around me and saying that, you know, in this world, in the people that we interact with and relate to, um, there are many people who don't believe in God. I mean, you look at the world, this is an option that you have. There are atheists who believe that God don't exist. There are agnostics who say God probably does exist, but we can't figure it out, so we're not going to really try to bother to do anything about it. But I'm sure some of these people are people that you know and love. And to be truthful, even as Christians, there are times in our lives, all of our lives, when we stop to wonder if God, is he real? And is he everything that we make him out to be? And is everything that his book says and the pastor says and you know everything that I hear being said, is, is all of that true? And I know lots of young people who, when they hit their teens, religion goes from being something that was their parents into uh, something that needs to become a relationship between them and, and God. Um, and, and they're encouraged to make it more personal than, than just, just something that their parents used to teach them about. And during that transformation of going from religion to relationship, there can be doubt that tends to creep in. And the thought that, yeah, I know, I know that this is what my parents believe, but is that enough for me? And how can I be sure that what I'm actually being taught is, is true? And this is a scary moment for parents and for grandparents who have their kids questioning. But the truth is, how do you think about it? Haven't we all been there at some point in our lives? Some point in our lives, haven't we all felt something stir inside of us uh, that, that just comes up from the, the depths of our soul? And whether it's stirred for mere moments, or stirred for years, or stirred for a lifetime, I think we can all kind of relate to that. Is the things that I'm being told, are, are they true? Are they true? I mean, when you look at the disciples, you look back in the, in the, in the, the Bible to what happens after Jesus' death. Jesus dies. Jesus is resurrected. The ladies go. They find out that he's come back to life. They run back to tell the disciples. And what do the disciples say? <laughs> You're crazy. You're crazy. I mean, I, I'm not going to believe this. I'm not going to believe this. And then Jesus appears to them. Sadly, Thomas is not there at that moment in time when everybody else um, gets the appearance. I don't know if he stepped over to the bathroom or what, but they, he must have taken his phone with him because he was gone for so long that he missed Jesus completely. And when uh, Thomas comes back, everybody's like, hey, we saw Jesus. He really did come back from life. We're back to life. The ladies were right. They're not insane. And Thomas is like, no, I, I'm not going to believe this. Not until I can feel the holes in his wrist and the nails in his, er, the holes in his feet. That, that's the only point where I'm going to believe. That, that this is true, and it didn't matter what, what they said. And these were the disciples. These were the people that traveled around with Jesus for all of those years, learning from his teaching. The people that we kind of follow suit after now. Man, and you think, man, if, uh, if, if the disciples themselves even had questions uh, of this uh, uh, rise up, then, then it's got to be okay. It's got to be okay. And, but the problem is, is that in churches, many, many churches today, if you hear somebody saying, I don't know, I'm struggling, you know, I'm just trying to kind of work through this, and some of these thoughts are coming in my head, and I'm, I'm trying to deal with it, you know, um, churches today, how do they react to that? They tell you to shut up. That's what they say. Don't even, don't even say that. I don't want to even hear you say that. And whether it comes through your own mind, or whether it comes out of somebody else's mouth, they say, just, just don't even talk about it. I, I don't want to have a conversation. And instead of allowing it, uh, the, the thought to develop, we, we just try to kind of shut it down. And, and we'll, we'll call it names and we'll insult ourselves or we'll insult them. And we use names like dumb or thick-headed or we'll do whatever we can to get your mind to stop thinking about this. And, and that's what drives me crazy. So here's, here's where we wind up. We're Christians. Every once in a while we have these thoughts come up or our kids or our friends have these thoughts come up. Okay, you know, can I believe all of this stuff? And what do we do whenever these thoughts come up? What's our answer to it? We
We try to make people to stop thinking. I mean, do you understand how ridiculous that is? We try to make them to stop thinking, and that is awful. But that's what we advocate. And it's, it's really not what somebody who is questioning needs to hear either. Because that line of thinking further entrenches the idea that if you're going to be a Christian, you're not allowed to ask questions. Folks, listen. We are not a cult. We are not a cult. And I know Randy and I wore the same shirt today. It's our cult shirt, but it, we didn't, it, it wasn't, that was cult Sunday's next Sunday. It wasn't supposed to be this Sunday. We just didn't get the memo out. We're not a cult. We don't make Kool-Aid downstairs. That's why we give orange juice and coffee, because we don't want you to be confused. We never ask you to buy Nike uh, shoes and then commit suicide so that as a comet or the spaceship that's going by, you can then be transferred up there. That's, that's not who we are. We are not a cult. So I don't want you to turn your brains off. That's what a cult would want you to do. That's not what I want. Instead, I want you to fire those things up and spin those things up in order to strengthen your resolve. You see, when doubt creeps in, we need to do the exact opposite of what everybody's telling us. We need to turn our brains on. We need to open our eyes up. And that's, that's when God's truth become evident. Faith. Is, divine, is defined as complete trust or confidence in something or someone. Hope is defined as confident expectation. And as Christians, we are asked to have faith or trust in God and hope or confidence in who he says he is and what he says he does it is a reality. We're never asked to believe in things that run completely contrary to everything that we observe, but instead we are asked to believe in God and then back up this belief with all of these observations that we have the opportunity to reinforce uh, our active brains with. Do you understand that? So here's the thing, folks. When you find somebody who is struggling, maybe it's you or maybe it's somebody else. When you find somebody who's struggling by questioning, don't shut up. Don't shut up. Talk even more. Turn that brain on. And I, I gave you a pen and I gave you a paper because I thought that might be the only way to keep you awake during this since I said the words go ahead. Hey! Wake back up, okay? Write this down. Get your pen, get your paper out, start to fall asleep, poke yourself with it, okay? Here's what you need, number one, in your sermon notes. This is the notes that I want you to take home and to contemplate and to think about, okay, if, if I'm struggling or somebody else is struggling, this is what we need to do to kind of think about, to, to kind of work through, to kind of pray through, to see if we can just allow these, these, these doubts to turn into uh, something better. Number one, just write this down real short. Turn that brain on. Turn that brain on. Please turn that brain on. Turn that brain on. Number one, you cannot work your way through this thoughts if you aren't going to spend time thinking about them. How can, how can, how can you get past the thoughts if you don't take the time to actually think about those thoughts? And what I'd like to give you to, uh, today is a way to turn on this brain and just four things for you to think about in your life and help somebody else think about so that you can kind of get the wheels rolling and get the spider webs and the dust off of it. Um, so here's where I want you to start thinking in order to, to really be able to process and really take a look at what's out there. So write down number two. And you can start putting yourself in the light if you won't write down anything for a little while after that. Number two, spend some real time, honestly, looking at the world around you. I know that one's longer, I'm so sorry. Number two, spend some real time, honestly, looking at the world around you. That's what you gotta do, guys. You're turning your brains on, and you're not just turning your brains on, you're opening your eyes, and you're seeing what's out there. Verse 20 of the scripture that Caleb read for us today, it explains this. Here's what it says. Since the creation of God's, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. You understand what, what the scripture is trying to get you to realize? It's saying, since the beginning of creation, for when God formed all of this stuff here, it was highly evident that he was the creator of this, that he was the one that put all of this into existence. And, and if you truly open your eyes and look at this world that we have around us out there, I mean, truly open your eyes with an unbiased heart and without entering into it uh, by searching uh, long and hard for a way for it to exist without him, if you don't go into the conversation looking for it to exist without him, you will find him everywhere. 
everywhere. When people don't see God in creation, it's either because at first, they don't really take the time to look at creation, or secondly, they're purposefully and willfully ignoring everything that points towards Him. You understand that? Let me go all nerd on you here for a second. I can't help it. I mean, I, I think I'm pretty much nerd all the time. But let me go a little bit deeper into the nerd um, right here. Because um, it's one of the things that I'm passionate about. Because I'm not just passionate about, um, about religion, but I'm also passionate about science. Very passionate uh, about science. And people who have um, desired a world to exist without God have had to turn to the concept of evolution. And they didn't turn to the concept of evolution because it was such a good theory. They turned to the concept of evolution because they needed a theory that would explain a world without God. And when you look at the theory of evolution, it's honestly got one of the least scientifically supported theories that we have ever embraced. And the only reason that we ever actually embraced it is because we just needed something to turn to to say this is without God. Um, and what will evolution tell you? Well, it'll tell you through, uh, through two ways. One is adaptation and the other one is gene mutation. <laughs> I know I was going to go too nerd, I'm sorry. Okay, but the way that evolution works is through millions and millions of years, an animal has to gain a breeding advantage. So something happens to its body, whether it's through a mutation or whether it's through an adaptation that makes it better suited to survive, which then breeds that animal's genes in, as the dominant gene and it keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. Do you understand what that means? That means, um, for example, you look at the giraffe. And the giraffe actually supposedly evolved from an animal known as the Climacoceras, which kind of looks like a giraffe, but it's a much shorter version of the giraffe. It has like a pretty short neck, but if you, if you imagine like somebody grabbing its head, yanking it up, then you can see a giraffe. So evolution will tell you that the, the giraffe came from the Climacoceras. And in order for it to become the giraffe over time, the taller ones, the ones whose necks have stretched, had more access to food. So they became dominant. And they continued to grow, became dominant, continued to grow, became dominant, continued to grow, and then over millions and millions of years, it changed from a climacoceras into a giraffe. Um, and they will tell you that over millions and millions of years, this evolutionary change was able to take place. And it looks like it might make sense, right? You know, higher food, next to grow, next to grow, continues to grow for millions of years. Yeah, it can look like a giraffe. But when you look at the science behind it, you get, you get something that's called irreducible complex, complexity. Irreducible complexity. Remember that word, okay? Because there's going to be a quiz afterwards, um, and you don't want to fail this. Irreducible complexity says in order for an animal to exist in its complex form, things would need to happen at the same moment in time. For example, a giraffe has a huge heart, massive, massive heart. Why do they have a massive heart? Because they got a massive neck. And in order to get that blood the whole way up from the bottom to the top of the giraffe, there's got to be a big old heart to pump that blood up to there. Which means that if a giraffe, a climacoceras was changing its giraffe and its neck was just changing without its heart changing, it would eventually reach a point in time where it would die because it couldn't get enough blood up there. So the heart would have to be changing with the neck, but why in the world would the heart be changing? It doesn't make sense for that to happen at the same exact time. So you would need to have the heart in place beforehand, so then the neck could continue to grow. However, if you put the heart of a giraffe inside a climacoceras, do you know what happens? The brain explodes, it's just boom, it blows up because the amount of pressure that is there. Not only would it explode, but inside the giraffe as well, giraffe's got these big long necks, but they still have to drink water that's on the ground. And when they tilt their head down to the ground, you know what happens? All that blood comes flying down the neck. So inside the giraffe, they actually have a sponge at the base of their skull that absorbs this blood that comes crashing down in. Because if that sponge doesn't there, do you know what would happen? The giraffe's brain would explode. So at the same time, in a giraffe, irreducible complexity says that the heart, the neck, and the sponge would have to be in place at the same exact time or Jack would not be able to exist. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? Evolution says one thing changes slowly, one at a time. But these things, these things need to exist at the same time. This is scientific, folks. This isn't just because the Bible says it. This is evolution doesn't make sense in the face of irreducible complexity. Just like your eyeballs. Just like your eyeballs. Eyeballs are made up of so many different, working, intertwined parts, and it needs all of them in place at the same time to work. You cannot develop the parts of the eye one at a time and then have them turn into an eyeball. It, it doesn't even slightly <laughs> make sense. They have to all be there at the same time, 
or not be there. Evolution is not possible in the face of irreducible complexity. And, and you can say, yeah, but there's millions and millions and millions. You know, take a Boeing 747, completely disassemble it, put it in a giant bag, shake it up for millions and millions and millions of years, and eventually are you going to open that bag and have a Boeing 747 come out of there? No. You can't take these intertwined parts and just have them magically come together and then have, have this very complex thing at the end. It, it doesn't work like that. And if you would actually look around you, look at yourself, look at your amazing body, look at the amazing animals that we have out there, you would see that these theories are simply a way to explain away God. That's all they are. In a way that you can numb yourself and, and, and believe it without really taking the time to think about it. Okay, so that, that was number two. Spend some time really honestly looking at the world around you. Number three, after you see this beautiful world around you that, that you have, take time to look even further than that. Okay, so number three is take time to look even further at the universe. Take time to look even further at the universe. Sometimes we get so stuck just in, in our own little portion uh, of, of this universe, thinking about our own little corner of the world, and that's all that it is. But I ask you, don't get stuck just looking at the earth. Look, look out further past the earth, and you will see the hand of God over and over and over again. You ever gone outside on a dark night, glance up the sky, and see how beautiful those stars are? That's one of the things I'd love to do if there's no moon outside. I love it. When I lived in Philly, you couldn't see them. I mean, you, you just saw a couple of stars, and then I moved out here. I said, wow, I thought, they, I thought there was a special effect. They just did movies. But you come out of here and, and you can just really see the beauty of what God has made, but, but it goes so much deeper than that. In 2004, uh, NASA pointed their Hubble um, telescope at a portion of the sky that appeared to be void of many stars. So they picked a portion and said, there's no stars up there. Let's point our telescope at it and see what is actually up there. Um, and they continued to point the Hubble at this exact spot for a few months to allow all of the light to bleed into it so that they could get a, a clear picture. And what they found was absolutely extraordinary. In this area of dark sky, the Hubble found 10,000 beautiful galaxies in this, in this sky that you couldn't see anything in. And I didn't say stars, I said galaxies. And in each of these galaxies, there were estimated to be 100 billion stars in, in, in these galaxies. 10,000 galaxies, 100 billion stars in a portion of sky that there appeared to be absolutely nothing. Let me tell you the most amazing thing. You got that penny? Yeah, that penny. Can you take that penny out for a second? Get your penny. You didn't lose it already. Pocket it. We didn't take offering, so I know it's not there. Okay, you got your penny? Look on the penny. If your eyes are good enough, you're going to see the words, In God We Trust. Can you see that on the penny? Need your glasses? It's okay. Trust me, the word's there. Take this penny, hold it out. Hold it like this. Do you see the D? Can you still see the D, the approximate size of the D? Pretend that you're holding that up to the sky, the inside of that D. That's what the Hubble telescope was looking at. That is where they found 10,000 galaxies with 100 billion stars inside the D of that penny. Now imagine how many times you could take that penny and then hold it up over the entire night sky. And that begins to give you just a little bit of an idea of the amount of creation that God has created. Hey, uh, leave my kid. Can you come up here for a second? Scientists cannot calculate accurately how much, uh, how many stars are in the sky. Um, even in the known universe. And outside of that, we don't know how big the universe is. We can't actually tell. So some of the best minds have done it. And this is the number that they came up with. If you were asked to say, how many stars are there in the universe? This is what they would tell you. This is their best guess. Can you stretch it across the front of the stage so that they can see that? The number that they came up with, yeah, it keeps going. No, 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 just for that. That's just for the fact. I could have made it bigger, but I didn't have enough paper. Yeah, anybody know what this number is? This, you do. You're going to feel dumb whenever I tell you it. It is a quator bigantillion. A quator bigantillion. You're like, oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Quator bigantillion. That is the number one with 24 zeros after it. One with 24 zeros. This is the number of stars that they believe is within our known universe, and we don't know how big it is, it goes past that. Do you understand how big this number is? I mean, it, I, I think like most of us, we make, like, we need to, this is one, 
Okay, like this. This is what we're used to seeing. Okay, this is like this is like us making a lot of money. That's like that's like you, and I'd like to be your friend then. Um, but this this is crazy. This is this is astounding. Thank you guys. Um, this is the amount that they think the uh, stars we, we may have out there, but, but, but you don't even understand how, how ridiculous this is. That's one with 24 zeros after. That is not counting planets. That is not counting moons. That is not counting other heavenly objects. And I want you to understand the enormity of this, because you see a number this big, and you're like, I, I can't even wrap my mind around it. But, but it's even worse than that. Mike, hold this up just for a second. Mike. Eight-inch soccer ball, we're going to call that the Earth, okay? We're going to call that the Earth, eight-inch soccer ball. If you take this eight-inch soccer ball and then compare this to the size of our sun, our sun would have the diameter of 78 feet compared to this ball. Compared to this ball, the Earth that we live on, that we feel is so big and so large and has so much mass, 78 feet, close to an eight-story building. So we got this 8-inch ball. Our sun is comparable to a uh, diameter of a 78-foot building. However, our sun is actually one of the smaller suns. If you look up uh, the largest star in our universe, it's the UY Scuti. That's what it's called. And in order to figure out how big this one is, you take that 8-inch ball, which is the Earth, and then UY Scuti, 24 miles compared to that. You would drive from East Brady to Butler, through Butler, and up to the community college. Katie, pretty good distance away. That is how big the largest star is compared to our Earth. The amount of mass that exists in the universe. Absolutely mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. And if you look past the front of your nose, you cannot help but see God. You cannot help but see God. I mean, what? They, they had to come up with the theory to say, okay, I don't know how all this got here. How in the world did all this get here? What did we say? We started evolution. That's how animals got here. But before that, what was the creation of the universe? How did they come through? What's it called? Somebody said it. Yeah, the Big Bang. Which is actually, it's less of an explosion and more of, if you think of a balloon. A balloon that was a subatomic particle, which means you can't see even, even under a microscope. It was smaller than that. Don't know really where that came from. But then you blew a whole bunch of air into it, and then it expanded into this universe. That is the Big Bang Theory. That it started from nothing, you blew into it, and it came into this. But when you really start to put numbers behind it, you understand how ridiculous it is to believe that even a slight possibility of this <coughs> existing without God being the divine creator. And that, that, that's the nerd portion of it. I, I understand, but that's the portion that speaks to me. I cannot, with an honest set of scientific eyes, look at the world and not see God. I can't not see God. And if you were looking for God, he's out there, folks. He's out there. But even better than that, if you were looking for God, start to turn inside. Look inside and you'll see a, even more. Number four, seek evidence of God in your life. Seek evidence of God in your life. Seek evidence of God in your life. God desires, and this is what we're talking about in the beginning, it's not just a religion, it's a relationship. God desires to be in a father-child relationship with you. And if you allow him to be that role in your life, I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, you will find him. You will find him if you are looking. From in your life, and I'll tell you, sometimes it's through small things. Sometimes it's through a kind word or advice that somebody gives you when you need it. Sometimes it's an unexpected blessing. Sometimes it's an answer to prayer. Sometimes it's in ways that you would have to be blind or purposefully dumb to miss. And one of the best examples that I have of this uh, recently um, happened one month ago when uh, when Krita passed away. And, and it, it was a difficult time for the family, and, and she was a, a dear friend. Um, so it was, it was one of those rough days, but it's a day that the, the family can tell you about because we received a blessing that we never <coughs> expected. As we were traveling from the church from here to the, the cemetery, um, and the cemetery was over in, uh, over in Worthington, um, a rainbow appeared in the sky. You think, oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah, a rainbow appeared in the sky. That's nice. Do you remember the acronym that they, they taught you in school about the rainbow? You remember? What is it? Roy G. Bay? Yeah, what's it stand for? Red, orange. Red, orange, yellow. Blue, indigo, violet. Yeah, I ran out of 
letters, I couldn't remember what you were going to say. Okay, so like red, <laughs> orange, yellow, that one looks like a green, that, that's, that's a blue, they call it, what they call that, indigo? Indigo and violet, yeah. Um, we're all wearing indigo today. Okay, so we got, we got the rainbow, right? Well, traditionally, when you look at a rainbow, I don't know if you notice this, but I love rainbows. I take pictures of rainbows every time I, that I get them. You get one end of the spectrum that is much more strongly seen than the other end of the spectrum just because of the ways that the rays work, and that's the red end of the spectrum. You see a lot of the red end of the spectrum. You see the beautiful, beautiful pretty red that starts, and then once in a while, you'll make it down to this indigo and violet. Usually you get to the indigo, by the time you get to the violet, really isn't much uh, um, left in, in my experience of rainbows. You know, it was neat, we were going to, uh, we were driving to the, the cemetery, um, and before we left there, one of the things that we talked about was the fact that um, Chris didn't like red. She just, the color red wasn't her favorite uh, color red, so if you look at the funeral, there wasn't any red at the funeral from anybody that, that knew um, Krita. And as we were driving through, first of all, this rainbow was brighter than any rainbow I've ever seen in my entire life. And I mean that. It was, it was so bright, so bright. And as we're driving, we have to drive directly past Glenn and Priya's house. And as you drive down the road, this beautiful brain, rainbow came right up over top of their house. And when you drove by that, you looked at that rainbow, and you know what you noticed? Okay. Barely any red. Barely any red at all, but you know what you really saw stronger than I have ever seen in my entire life? Violet. The most beautiful violet you have ever seen. We watched that rainbow from the time that we got on Tanning Hollow Road until virtually the moment that we arrived at the cemetery. It was a special, special moment for, for myself and for the entire family. And you think, okay, well, that's a, that's a really nice coincidence, Pastor. That's great. Yeah, was it a coincidence? Was it a coincidence that this rainbow appeared on this sorrowful yet joyous day of celebration of Priya's life? Was it a coincidence that a rainbow appeared at the exact moment that we were leaving and disappeared almost at the exact moment that we arrived? Was it a coincidence that at the moment we were driving by her house, this rainbow was so bright, so bright, and so full of violet, not red? Violet. Man, if you were looking for coincidences, you can find coincidences everywhere. But this was all inspiring. This was a moment that would stick with the family for the rest of the days, just telling them, she's with me. She's at home. If you are truly seeking for God, if you are truly seeking for God, you will find his impact in your life in big and small ways. And when you are doubting, when you are doubting, I'm telling you, just seek evidence of him out in your life. If you look, you will find him. And just one last thing, okay? One last thing. Because there's one super important place that you can find him. You can find him within you. If you actually take the time to look. So number five, take time to look by spending time doing. Take time to look by spending time doing. When you accept Jesus as your Savior, God fills you with the Holy Spirit. And the more time you spend with Him, the deeper that presence becomes. It really does. Lots of times people will say, ah, I don't know, I'm just feeling really unsure right now about God, if He's there, if He's really listening, if He really cares, and all these uh, other sorts of things. And then, and then I'll ask them, well, have you been praying? Have you been talking to Him? Hey, well, occasionally. Have you been reading His book? Every once in a while, I guess. Have you been praising him in song? No, not really. Have you been seeking him out in a good church? Not very often. So let me get this straight. You're telling me that you're trying to discover God, that you're trying to find him, that you're trying to, to eliminate doubts, that you're trying to you know, reach a connection with him to see if he's really there, but it doesn't sound like you're actually even looking. How do you expect to find someone that you are not looking for. It's like me and you going to play a hide and seek game and I go upstairs to hide in the closet. I'm going to die before you get up there because you're just hoping that you kind of come across me because you're not actively looking. You're not actively seeking. And if you want to find God, guess what you have to do first? You have to actually take the time to look for him. And I guarantee you, if you take the time to look for him, if you take the time to invest in him, if you take the time to actually spend those moments connecting with him, 
You will find him, and you will find him in amazing ways. Not just, not just inside, in, in, in your soul, in your spirit. I mean, you will feel that love and that peace and that forgiveness. And, and, and it's something that's so hard to explain to somebody else who hasn't had it yet. But when you get it, you know what I'm talking about. But not just that, but when you are in a constant communication with him, man, things, things just change. Things just change. When you give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to work through you, I promise that you will be left with experiences that will reinforce those beliefs that will take away those doubts for the rest of your, your days. I, I just, one more story. Let me share one more story because this one means a lot to me. Um, I, I was visiting someone one time. I was asked to visit someone one time um, who was in hospice at their home and dying. Death was imminent. We knew that it was coming, so they asked me to go over. This was a guy that didn't really go to church, never stepped foot in church unless it was a wedding or a funeral and, and didn't have a relationship. So I said, yeah, I'll, I'll go over I'll go over, and this, this guy was at his house, and his, his older son was staying there with him to help take care of him, and he was pretty much bedridden now. He was in bed, couldn't come out of the bedroom. So uh, the son met me at the door, he took me inside, we were just chatting in his room, and uh, in his room was the television, and the son was in there watching, small room, and as I visited with this man, it was son was in this room watching The Price is Right so loudly. I mean, man, I couldn't hear anything good with Jim Carrey, no, no, Drew Carey, for, for quite some time. Um, but I didn't feel like it was my right to tell them that they had to turn their TV down. So I continued to visit in spite of the fact that, you know, we were struggling to hear each other. Um, and as I was aware that he would be passing soon, I, I thought I need to talk to him to make sure that he's ready to go if God says it's time for him to go home. So I asked him if he's ever heard of Jesus' sacrifice in his life, and I explained to him how it doesn't matter what he did. If he believes that Jesus died on the cross for his sins, he has a place saved for him for all eternity in heaven. And he said that he'd never, he'd never professed that, but he did believe it, and he wanted to, uh, he wanted to pray to ask Jesus into his life. Um, I'd never led someone in the sinner's prayer before while Christ is right was blaring in the background. <laughs> I thought, oh, we, we can do this. It's okay. We can do this. So I asked him to pray after I prayed, and I started my prayer. And the second that I started my prayer, the TV shut off. And I thought, well, thank God for the son. He was clearly listening. And now this has not just impacted one person, but it's impacted um, two people. So we prayed the whole time, said, uh, said the, the, the prayer. Uh, we got done praying. Man was very grateful. I stood up to leave, said, you know, if you need anything, I, I just really want to be there for you. And the son stood up to come out of the room with me. And uh, as we were walking out of the room, he turned back to his dad and he said, Dad, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna take him to the door and I'll come right back in. And when I get back in here, I'll find out what's wrong with that TV. Because that TV shut off, I couldn't get that thing to turn back on no matter what I did. I'll get it when I come back in. My son came back in the room, pushed a button, and that thing fired right back up. It was a coincidence that that television shut off at the exact moment that I started praying the sinner's prayer with this man. Was that a coincidence? Hey, that's how you want to explain it away, but I can feel God at work in my life. And I'm not saying there's anything special about me, but I'm saying when you enter into a situation with prayer and then go in with your eyes open, you can find God. You can find God. He's there. And that doubt can go away, but you've got to be willing to put the effort into it to make it move. You aren't going to find him if you're not looking for him. Let me close you by reminding you just one more time of the things that we talked through, just so that you remember these points and you can take them home with you. If you're struggling with doubt, or you know that somebody's struggling with doubt, number one, turn the brain on. Don't, don't kill it. No, activate it. Because if you activate that brain, you're going to find God. Number two, spend some real time honestly looking at the world around you. If you go into it with an open slate, man, his creation is so beautiful, so amazing, so intertwined that it could not have happened any other way than my divine creation. Number three, take time to look even further at the universe. If you're wondering if he's there, stop thinking so small. Look bigger, and you'll understand there is no way for this all to exist without him. Number four, seek evidence of God in your life. When you are questioning, seek evidence out of him in your life. He is there, he is active, but only if you choose to look for him and see him. And number five, take time to look by spending time doing. You understand, you can't expect to understand or feel someone if you aren't actually putting time in, spending time with him, how can you say whether or not he's real if you didn't even take the time to spend time with him to see if he was real? I'm telling you folks, 
If you truly seek him and encourage others to seek him, in those moments of doubt, I promise you, I promise you, you will find him. That's only going to happen if you take the time to look. You understand? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for today, for this moment, for this time. And God, I, I, we've all been there. God, we've all been there. Some of us may be there right now. And we just ask that you would help us. God, speak to us. Turn those brains on. Help us to open not just our hearts, but our minds so that we may reinforce what our soul already knows. You are there. You love us. I thank you for being such a good dad. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.